So first of all, we'll be talking to Lal Vikram from the Las Santos Baller, who is the publisher of his uh, Sunday Media newspaper. He, he'll be joining us uh, from Colombo, and it's very late there, so uh, five and a half hours different. So we will talk to him first, and then um, we have the panel members. I think if you uh, uh, read the the web page, you probably know who we are and who uh, each member is. Uh, Pearl he was a journalist in Sri Lanka who had moved here many years ago. Um, she worked in uh, press, uh, print media in Sri Lanka. Um, she has been working with the exiled uh, reporters since here, uh, she came to London. Um, she will be talking about her experiences. And then we have Jai Devan, who um, had been involved in uh, some activities with the Tamil Tigers at some point. And uh, since then, he had, uh, he had some experiences which he might uh, well uh, talk to you about. But uh, today, we are here not to talk about what happened, but what is going to happen and how we cover uh, the situation in Sri Lanka. So, Jayadevan and Francis Harrison used to be uh, the correspondent, BBC correspondent in Sri Lanka for four years. Four years, and then since then she was in Iran, and now she's back in London. And she had uh, many times she had traveled to the uh, north, had met the Tamil Tigers, and had a very interesting time. I think <laughs> is the word. Uh, in covering Sri Lanka for the BBC. And Charu uh, Lata Hogg uh, used to be a journalist uh, who worked in Sri Lanka for a few years. She covered Sri Lanka for uh, Indian newspapers and some work for the BBC. And now she works for the Human Rights Watch as the uh, person researcher for Sri Lanka. Um, they got a report out on Sri Lanka only two days ago, wasn't it? Yeah. So, which is al also talks about the plight of the the civilians at the moment. Um, I think we can actually go to Lal is he, if he's ready. You know, we have about a hundred people here uh, waiting to listen to you um, yeah. on um, what happened to your brother and you know what is what is happening right now. Uh, I think we are more interested in what is really happening at the moment in Sri Lanka, <coughs> you know, trying to cover the story, trying to cover the war uh, since since La Santa's <coughs> murder. Uh, how has it been for you covering the story? Uh, when you say covering the story, do you mean covering the war or covering the, the uh, murder itself? Oh, yeah, a bit of both, actually. actually the, what, what is the latest about uh, the investigation into the murder of La Santa Vikramatunga? Uh, at the moment, there is absolutely nothing more than what we knew uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, we Can you speak up a bit? We know nothing more than what we knew at the beginning. The investigation itself is at a dead end. And, uh, her, you know, I, uh, we, uh, since the uh, incident, his wife had to leave the country, uh, um, along with many other journalists who had left Sri Lanka in the last few months. Um, what led to her departure? Uh, there was the concern for the attack on the media. Uh, even a minister within this government admitted since January 2006, nine media personnel have been killed, 27 either have been abducted or assaulted. None of these have been solved yet. So there, there is also senior officials of government who go on national media and threaten journalists, naming them, saying either they are unpatriotic or supporters of the LTTE, and then they go away. Uh, so there is a, a, a 
appear psychosis about this uh, with the media uh, and also they they have now started to self censor their writing so how is it in the, is it for you uh, there are few people who had been uh, military analysts and people who had left and how is it for you at the moment covering the story of the plight of the civilians and what is happening in Sri Lanka? Nobody will write anything that will antagonize uh, the people against uh, the army or individuals within the army. Even where the uh, internally displaced persons are concerned, one would never go to the length of writing what he or she would independently assess uh, on the ground. It has been a tough time because uh, unless you write uh, the, the official version that is given by the government, no one has really had independent access to make up or uh, formulate what they feel is what is happening on the ground. There is a particular issue where uh, it not the government is not allowing peop uh, journalists to enter the war zone. At the same time, the people who had traveled out of the war zone, the, uh, the government's not allowing them to meet journalists. Uh, have you ever tried to, or has any of the colleagues tried to speak to any of these people who are coming out of the war zone? No. Even the local and the foreign media will be taken to the war zone or just beyond the war zone or even to the camps only with the accompanied by the government officials. There is uh, no access into various areas, nor are we able to go and speak to any of those people who come out from those areas in an independent manner to ascertain by ourselves, or for that matter, the journalists, as to exactly what's happening on the ground. So what can actually you write about the war at the moment? Most people write only what the government hands out to the military uh, spokesperson or uh, the police spokesperson as to what's happening. What about the other side, the rebels? You know, have have you had any any chance of contacting them or interviewing them? Well, no, not since the war intensified and the LTT has been banned. Nobody will ever dare uh, get hold of the, a banned organization for fear of being demanded. So, is there censorship? Uh, there, uh, there's no official censorship in Sri Lanka, but there is actual censorship happening at the moment. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's a very short answer. Um, I'm going to uh, ask people, uh, whoever in the audience, if they want to ask any questions from you before you go back to bed. Um, Lal, is there anybody who wants to ask a question from Lal? Can you identify yourself? I can only say that I heard the can, can you wait for the microphone? Hold on. For the microphone. Oh, there's one gentleman at the end. Yeah, okay. Yes, I, <coughs> I just wanted to ask uh, Lal about uh, what level of uh, awareness is there amongst the, particularly the Sinhalese community, about what is really going on? So given that there's such a tight, well, let's, say, let's face it, it is censorship, officially or otherwise. What is so, you know, what is the level of uh, awareness of the real happenings there? Did you hear that, Lal? Yes, I did. There is, uh, there is absolute apathy uh, amongst the majority community as far as wanting to find out uh, exactly what is going on uh, amongst the civilians or those who are uh, caught in between the two. Uh, fighting factions. Uh, all that they have said through the government media, on the government TV, or the state uh, 
Central Broadcasting Corporation is that the Sri Lankan army is gaining ground and we have had senior officials of government rising up to the Secretary of uh, uh, Defense in the government stating that any dissent is not allowed and if anybody does, is not with us, is considered against us. But Lal, there were reports from the UN Human Rights Watch <coughs> and ICRC about the plight of the civilians. So can't you even quote them in your uh, output? Which we do. Uh, in fact, uh, we do say uh, only so much. Uh, we, but uh, even they don't give numbers. Uh, they don't uh, uh, go as far as saying uh, who is injured. Uh, how many are still being held or are in the, the uh, uh, LTTL area? We might have one more question for Lal uh, before he goes away. Uh, Actually, you uh, seem to know more being overseas than uh, the, the people in Sri Lanka. Is there, is there anybody who wants to... Uh, Hello, uh, I'm a City University student, and before coming here, I spoke to a Sri Lankan journalist who is hiding in Sri Lanka at the moment. Just a quick question, actually, to Lal, that do you think these stories are worth giving up your lives for? I mean, I'm sorry, I came in late. I don't know if that's been answered already or not, but uh, if it hasn't been, please. Is any story worth giving your life for, Lal? Most, most uh, journalists would not. But uh, we, we have set a standard. Uh, we have uh, decided to go as far as we are allowed to go, or even beyond that. And uh, if everybody was to say, is it worth giving up your life uh, for doing that, then, then uh, the, it, it is a hopeless situation here. Thank you, Lal. Uh, I think we'll let you go back to bed now, and we'll continue uh, our uh, discussion here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to uh, the panel. Uh, and uh, the members of the panel will do a very small presentation, uh, will speak a little. And then uh, we, we need to have some time to discuss uh, and answer questions. And uh, I hand over to Pearl to talk about uh, the, her experiences and covering the war in Sri Lanka. Hi. I got the shock when I heard my former editor was killed on the 8th of uh, January this year. When La Santa was killed in, uh, on January 8, 2009, I was uh, very shocked but not surprised because he is the one who gave me access. <laughs> access to the north and east when uh, the state-owned newspaper I worked for wouldn't even let me write about what's going on there except um, commissions of inquiry. Uh, he gave me unlimited access. He was fearless. I was willing and eager uh, for that. Um, I was arrested in 95. That, uh, that day still haunts me because I didn't know I was going to come out alive and I didn't tell any of my family. But once I got arrested, I realized I'm not going to let this government or anyone stop us going there. If I held that kind of attitude, La Santa's attitude was hundredfold. It, so Sri Lanka has very brave journalists, local journalists I'm talking about, because the foreign journalists have um, insurance, facilities, equipment, 
but our local correspondents risk their lives. And when something happens to them, they have nothing to fall back on. The impunity of the government into murdering some 17 journalists, and in total, 37 journalists since Richard D. Soiza was murdered in 1990 for exposing the, um, the Marxist insurrection during which time some over 50,000 youth were killed. So 36 journalists in uh, since 19, that is how many years? Yeah, 19 years. So two journalists per year. And scores attacked and um, arrested, intimidated. So what can we do about this? First of all, um, uh, has international pressure worked? No, with this government, it hasn't. There are, we do have laws. And um, the Official Secrets Act of 1955 and PTA, which is Prevention of Terrorism Act, brought in, if I'm correct, uh, 72? Yeah, seven, yeah, 71, I think. 71, yes. Now, these two are used to muzzle journalists. You can be arrested and held without uh, charge for up to 72 hours, it used to be. But uh, Tisanayagam is being held for almost a year. Charges were brought against him. He's still in prison. Um, I don't know what can be done about this. But people, news is leaking out. But the government, uh, Sri Lankan journalists mainly, are in danger. Are we going to wait? How long are we going to wait? 10 days ago, Tamil journalist, who is a freelancer, was killed in the crossfire in the east, northeast. Is Sri Lanka's, uh, I mean, sometimes I wonder whether Sri Lankan lives, Sri Lankans are lesser human beings. Because international media covers Gaza, Sudan, Iraq, but we have, La Santa's murder is the only thing that brought a little bit of attention to the international community. Um, I don't know what can be done. I mean, I would like to go back. There's one thing I want to tell. The thinking of the government was reflected in an Eastern commander's reply to my question. Why are you not sending food to the rebel-held East? So he casually told me, you know, if we send food to those children, they'll grow fat only to join the LTT. So I don't know. During Chandrika's time, I felt a bit safe compared to the previous regime, which was uh, Premadasa, who was killed by a suicide bomber in 93 on May Day. Chandrika's time was better, but this president's tenure is the most frightening period for journalists. And I dread to think uh, what this, what, what's going to happen to the future of uh, journalists in Sri Lanka. And also, I'm concerned, and that's not my area, but concerned about the wanton killings, I would say, of civilians in their hundreds at the moment in the crossfire. 
Yeah, thank you, Pearl. Uh, now, um, as she said, you know, there is a question of impunity where uh, journalists have been killed. Uh, I lost one of my colleagues who was a Jaffna reporter. Nearly 10 years now, we can't still re replace him. S uh, during the curfew, three people came into his house, shot him, and walked out. Uh, he's, I had been to his house. He, <coughs> he lived just near a checkpoint. And during curfew in Jaffna, to, so for people to go around with guns and grenades and kill somebody and go away. And nearly 10 years, nobody's been you know, punished for it. So this, this is uh, my colleague called Nimal Rajan. I feel responsible for his death because I was his editor. So there are so many uh, people since uh, who had been uh, killed like that and before him and after him. So, but nobody has ever been brought to justice. Uh, although we can't blame the government or point the finger at the government, the only thing people in Sri Lanka can say is, you know, bring the, bring the perpetrators to justice. So there is a culture of impunity. Uh, so we'll move on to um, next speaker, <coughs> Rajiv Jayadevan. Thank you, Priyat. Of course, uh, you would have seen my background uh, background in the introduction there. In addition to that, I would like to say, um, since there were some questions about my media engagement, I would like to say that uh, I was, I am involved in the uh, media work. I am the founder of the Tamil Guardian, and uh, I actively work for the Hot Spring, which was uh, produced by the LTT in the UK. Then I also formed the um, Budhudalai uh, Tamil newspaper that, that ran for about a year. At present, I'm contributing, contributing to <coughs> Sri Lanka Guardian and also TamilAffairs.com. Uh, these are my media activities. It, is continu it was continuous, and uh, I'm uh, contributing uh, in the spirit that uh, we can bring uh, greater awareness within both the communities, that is the Tamils and the Sinhalese, uh, to bring about peace in Sri Lanka. Now, as you know, I have, uh, I have been in the political front for the last uh, so many years, 30 years, uh, since mid-70s. Uh, I have experienced uh, uh, quite a bit of the problems on both sides, from the uh, Sinhalese uh, to the Tamil side. and. Uh, I have also lost my mother and brother in the violence. So there is a fair share of experience that we have. Um, having said that, what is the situation? What are we going to do uh, to change the situation? This is what is important. And uh, the impunity that is prevailing in Sri Lanka, uh, that has to be changed. And I consider the LTT is the product of the systematic violations against the Tamil people by the government. And uh, LTT may have its own history, that is beside the point. But the government has to be accountable. That is, what, that is what my position is. And recently, the present government has gone beyond um, all levels to undermine freedom. And human rights have been violated. And there is considerable impunity that is prevailing, and there is fear among the people. There is pressure at the moment that the, the, uh, there should be ceasefire, and both parties must engage in peace talks. This is necessary. But this has, we have seen many times this is happening. And uh, my consideration on this matter is that unless there is a bipartisan agreement between the opposition and the ruling party, we won't see end of the time. The Sri Lankan constitution, the governance, <coughs> is very polarized, very dictator dictatorial. And we haven't seen proper bipartisan agreement between both the parties, that is, the, between within the Sinhalese. And if that comes to being, then we can see some forward move. And Sinhalese themselves, if they realize that Tamils have to be empowered, 
they can come out with a proposal and they can basically start the process. Now we have seen this, uh, these ceasefires, these uh, proposals to resolve the conflict. Uh, these didn't have any engagement from the opposition. Always the opposition will be in the backyard. And uh, finally, that is, we, we, we lose, the, lose the spirit of uh, any resolution. So what we have to do is, it is very important the bipartisan agreement process is pitched. During mid-90s, there was some effort made by Dr. Liam Fox to get a bipartisan agreement. Uh, that is the British effort. And that, didn't, that lasted for some time, but uh, it didn't produce anything, and it died down. Recently, with this government, there was an, some agreement to reach a bipartisan agreement that also didn't last because the government ensured that uh, it went it went to the extent of uh, grabbing some opposition party members and that has fallen through so it is it is absolutely essential it must be a prerequisite before any ceasefire these two parties must come to an agreement and they must be open and transparent in their dealings and uh, go forward to resolve the conflict in the best possible manner. Thank you. Um, I think uh, our next speaker is uh, Francis. <laughs> so Francis was in Sri Lanka. And uh, at the moment, there are a lot of uh, Sri Lankan journalists leaving uh, because they can't operate. They are, they are under threat. Um, as a foreign correspondent, <coughs> You have certain freedom. You know, the, the people who do your translations, carry your bags, book your hotel, <laughs> <laughs> they get killed. <laughs> uh, they get killed, you know, exactly like Himal Rajan, uh, who worked for Francis, knew. No, uh, I you knew, didn't, I you knew didn't. His yeah, he knew his family. And Francis was helpful, helpful <coughs> because his mother and father was also injured by the attackers, and then he had to get them out of the country. Even at the moment, there are so many people who are leaving the country because, but there are s some people who are uh, actually staying and fighting and trying to work. So Frances will talk about her experience and what yeah. what's happening. Well, maybe I should start with Nimal Rajan first, mm -hmm. um, who was the singer section stringer in Jaffa, and. <laughs> Tamil too, okay, <laughs> and um, you own him, <laughs> good. Um, I think you know one of the most difficult things was how long it took to get his family out of the country. And this is just one example, and there have been lots more since, unfortunately, and before. It took about a year and a half to get them out of, well, they came out of Jaffna, they stayed in Colombo. They were quite scared at times, and scared of routine checks of their police passes and so on, their papers, and they would be very worried. And we approached the British High Commission and asked if we could get them asylum in Britain. And we were basically told, don't even try, don't bother. There were so many of them, too. It was a large extended family of 11 members. He was basically supporting you know, his sister, children, and so on. And it took, we applied for asylum that in another European country. It didn't work. And it was almost a chance meeting with somebody in Canada that eventually got them emigration to Canada and the fact they already had some relatives there. So it was a very difficult process, even with our backing, you know, um, my colleagues, Singhalese and uh, colleagues in Colombo who helped a lot. And even at the last point when they were about to leave, um, you know, they'd got the tickets <coughs> and what have you, they needed police clearance, and that was blocked. And it seemed very spiteful in a way that the last <coughs> moment they we had to kind of pull in a lot of favors. We had to get journalists, friends of ours, to call people in the police, get this police clearance. So. You know, then they sort of slipped away, nobody noticed, they left, you know, there was no, they just vanished really and obviously can't come back. And that was just one of these 37, I don't know, depends how many you count, journalists over the years who've been killed. I mean, the ripple effects are huge for the families and um, he was, uh, they were arguably one of the lucky families that got out, you know, but with a lot of trauma and stress. So now what I've seen is people I knew in Sri Lanka as, as journalists who worked there emerging in London in the last month or two uh, with their families, claiming asylum, they're going abroad, 
I think dozens of journalists, increasingly Sinhalese journalists, not just Tamil journalists like Nimurajan and some, many of the others who've already left or stopped working. And I think, um, I mean, Pearl is obviously right that those who work for the international media have a degree of protection, insurance, equipment, and so on. But, you know, to what extent do these uh, Sri Lankan journalists who work for foreign organizations get protected when they stop doing their jobs, when they leave Sri Lanka and they go abroad? You know, do they get a job in London? Do they get reposted somewhere else? This is a big issue. And do, their, do the organizations really understand the kind of risks they ran and the effects on them and the fact that they can't go back and they don't know when they can go back? I mean, certainly for their families, it's extremely difficult for them you know, to cope with the stress <coughs> of moving. They don't come to London because they think it's better. They come because you know, they, think they hope that they can stay alive. And many of them have been proved right in retrospect by what's happened to Los Santos. So um, I think you know, there is something we can do. We can support those people who are in exile. And we don't even know how many there are and how, where they've gone, all of them. Many of them have, have vanished. So that's something clear. Um, I, I think one of the questions was why uh, doesn't the international media cover it more? I think you know a lot of people here probably know. I mean, are either Sri Lankan or have a connection and know a lot about it. But um, one thing that struck me was when I went for the first round of peace talks, there were other journalists there covering them in th in Thailand, and there were journalists who would come up to me from very reputable organisations who would ask me, "Oh, um, the Tamil Tigers, they're Muslims, aren't they?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the idea, I suppose, in their mind was terrorist, Muslim, etc. And you'd have to explain, and then you try and explain the kind of complicated politics of Sri Lanka in sort of 20 minutes before breakfast, it was impossible. So there is a lot of, of lack of understanding. It is a very complicated story, and sometimes we forget how difficult it is for people outside to follow it and to follow the intricacies of it. At the same time, you know, Sri Lanka doesn't have oil, doesn't have nuclear weapons or nuclear technology strategically, not as significant. You could argue it has some importance, but not as significant as no, many other Islamic. countries. No and no, no Muslim terrorists, of course, too. <laughs> and they <laughs> so I think that's one of the reasons. And then, of course, for international journalists, a lot of them don't get visas now to go in if they want to cover the war. <coughs> so it's very difficult for them. If they rely on local stringers, it's extremely dangerous to do that. It's arguably questionable whether you should do that and put them at risk. So, um, and we've mentioned local stringers. I mean, the provincial ones even more, the ones outside Colombo even more at risk. And I think, you know, just to put it in perspective, I think Pearl spoke very nicely about, you know, how painful it is and how difficult it is. But I was in Sri Lanka at arguably the best time, you know, during the three years of the peace process and one year of war. And it was, you know, relatively free. You could go to the tiger areas, you could move around and so on. But even I had quite a lot of trouble. <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of, um, you know, very nasty phone calls, very aggressive emails from people. I mean, in the end, I actually papered my uh, studio walls with uh, very aggressive newspaper articles about me, accusing me of being a terrorist, of being a war agent, of being everything you can possibly think of. So, you know, the good times, at the best of times, even then, it was a very tense, very difficult story to tell, even for someone like me, protected by the BBC and so on. So, how much more difficult now for Sri Lankan journalists who say that? Thank you, Francis. Um, I, I remember there were times when uh, government officials said, oh, Francis's visa, we are not going to extend it and next time. Because that's uh, the amount of pressure Francis was in. Anybody who's trying to tell the story uh, with the other side, you know, the recently the uh, uh, brother of the president gave an interview. Uh, he's the defense secretary uh, to the BBC, to Chris <coughs> Morris, who he said will never, ever be allowed into Sri Lanka ever again. <laughs> um, uh, he, he said, you know, there are two groups of people in Sri Lanka who are for the war and who are against it or who are not for the war. You know, we, just like George Bush said, you know, we either you are with us or against us. Um, now we move on to Charu. Uh, the Charu had been doing a lot of work on the human situation, the, the, the plight of the civilians. Yeah in Sri Lanka at the moment, it is a uh, grave concern. Uh, Charu. Thanks, Priyat. Um, hello, everybody. Before I start, I'd just like to say something about Human Rights Watch's work on Sri Lanka. We've had numerous allegations and accusations over the years that we tend to cover only abuses by the government or only by the entity. Just to set the record straight, um, till 2006, <coughs> Human Rights Watch's work was largely 
on the LTT and abusive practices by the LTT. Since 2006, we have noticed a definite deterioration in the rights record of the government. Uh, disappearances, abductions, extrajudicial killings, attacks on the media, attacks on NGOs. It's a huge litany of human rights violations that the government stands accused of today. But what I would like to focus on right now is the condition of civilians, because that's a big question mark. You know, it's come, out, come in the course of this discussion in terms of how does the media access the conflict zone. Human Rights Watch was lucky enough to conduct a two-week two uh, field trip in the north of the country in January and obtained some very, very sensitive and um, crucial information which points out as to what exactly is going on in the conflict areas. Our reporting has found out that over 2,000 civilians have been killed since the outset of, conflict, of fighting since January 2009. Over 5,000 civilians have been seriously injured, and these are conservative estimates based on reports by in independent monitors, the few that exist, the few humanitarian agencies, the few UN agencies that exist on the ground, and largely on, on victim testimony. Both sides are conducting gross violations of the rules of war. These include indiscriminate shelling on civilians, the government is doing that apace. It is also shelling areas which are marked as safe zones. It has repeatedly bombed hospitals. The LTT, on the other hand, is, has it, its own sets of atrocities on the civilians it claims to, uh, to represent. The LTT has prevented civilians from leaving the conflict areas. It has virtually used civilians as human shields. It has fired on civilians who have tried to flee these areas. We have some very, very moving testimony of parents, mothers, fathers. A father, when he was fleeing the, uh, the conflict zone with his four-year-old son, broke his son's arms because he was holding on to him so, so tight, and he was trying to dodge the shelling that was coming from all sides. Um, once the few civilians, our approximate number is about 30 to 40,000 civilians have perhaps managed to leave the LTT areas. Once these civilians come out into the government side and perhaps heave a sigh of relief of being out of the conflict zones, they are then being taken in by the government into what they call welfare centers, but are actually detention camps. And they are heavily militarized. There's presence of military intelligence in these camps. No humanitarian agencies are, are allowed access to these camps. No media is allowed into these camps. The hospitals actually mirror what is going on in these camps. There are no pain medications, there are no um, uh, anesthetic drugs, the, the level of antibiotics, there is, a, there is absolutely virtually no medical supplies available in these hospitals, and yet the government says that it has enough to take care of people, and, humanitarian, and they have repeatedly stopped humanitarian convoys from entering the conflict areas, and also, uh, also prohibited supplies from getting into the hospitals. They have also put pressure on doctors not to talk to humanitarian agencies, not to talk to other people outside to show how bad the conditions are. So in a nutshell, we have a situ situation where civilians, some 200,000 of them, are trapped in these abysmally shocking conditions, either in the detention centers or within the conflict zones where they are either taking cover in under bunkers or they're scrambling for their lives in the fields and trying to make it to the other side. Um, as I said before, both sides, not just one, both are committing gross violations of the rules of law, of war, of humanitarian law, and of human rights law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we open the discussion. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can ask away. The news reports I read in the UK imply that the Tamil Tigers are going to lose. Do you think they're going to lose? Who do you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. Um, from, you know, um, because I day-to-day -day cover the story, I can, you know, others can join in. Um, militarily, in the conventional battle, 
they are losing ground, they are losing territory. But from the reports we get, uh, we don't see the government forces uh, capturing any heavy weapons or killing hundreds and thousands of tigers. Um, they seem to be capturing territory. And only last week we were speaking to uh, the political head of the Tamil Tigers. Um, I don't know here, he's in complete denial or just gone mad, but he seemed uh, you know, comparatively sane and um, focused on uh, what he's doing. And uh, um, I don't know, I mean, the government is obviously gaining ground and um, they, they captured seven airstrips, but still planes came through to Colombo only a few days ago. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we can deny that government is actually making headway. I think this phase of the war will end and it might develop into something else. Anybody else want to add anything? Uh, I said that friend, yes, if you want. Um, I think the kind of key point is the shrinking territory. I mean, it leaves the Tigers very cornered and they've got only a very small strip of coastline. But the equipment <coughs> is a really interesting issue. I mean, the <coughs> army seems to be uh, showing on the internet pictures of some of the equipment they've you know, captured, like the submarine. But the very heavy um, guns or some of the Tigers' very sophisticated uh, gunboats, which you know, we've seen, uh, don't seem to have been captured, and, and we don't really know what's happened to them. Gunboats, of course, could have been sunk, but you know, there's a lot of um, multi-barrel rocket launchers, artillery. I mean, they're very, uh, they have very conventional equipment, military equipment, not sort of just Kalashnikovs. They're a very well-armed army at the best of times when they're operating. So where that equipment has gone, I'm not sure. And I suppose there are also questions about ammunition supplies, whether they can still get those in at the moment. But in terms of territory shrinking and their, their power administration and so on, it's basically gone. Look, uh, my name is Arjunan Ethibir Singham, uh, Tamil's Rehabilitation Organization, um, Vani. Um, just a, pre a comment, uh, seven of my coworkers were um, abducted and executed in Sri Lanka a few years ago. I myself was attacked and had my front teeth knocked out and had to leave the country. Um, currently, TRO is the only organization receiving video from the Vani. Um, you might, might have seen it on CNN, Al Jazeera, Sky News, etc. I have a short question for Charhu. Um, it it's has a little setup. I hope you'll bear with, with me. Um, the question is, uh, the recent Human Rights Watch describes some war crimes occurring in the Northeast, but it refuses to call them genocide. My question is, when the situation in the Vani is a virtual reenactment of the Bosnian Srebrenica genocide where 7,000 Muslims were killed, and Sri Lankans armed forces have been employed bombing and shelling in order to herd 350,000 Tamils into a government prescribed safe zone where they have been 2,000 slaughtered, 5,000 to 7,000 injured, as you said, um, and in the 18 months prior to this, they blocked humanitarian aid, and in September of 2008, ordered the United Nations and international human rights humanitarian organizations out of the area, and in January 2007, stopped all international media from going in. The LTTE welcomes the media to come in, but the government won't let them. With all of this, and with the recent statement by the ICC prosecutor about the president of Sudan, al-Bashir, stating that his motive was political, al with an alibi of counterinsurgency. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between Sudan um, and the Srebrenica and what is going on in the Vani? And why don't you call it genocide? Thank you. Uh, well, the casualties that we've spoken about are caused by both sides. This, this figure that I've used, the 2,000 figure, are not casualties attributable to the Sri Lankan army alone. So it is not the Sri Lankan army alone which is out on a rampage. There have been killings and shootings by the LTT as well. So, you know, to, to break it down further, even the people who have been injured, a large number of them have reported injuries caused due to and wounds because of the LTT firing at them. You know, so if it is, if you would like to term it as a genocide, which we don't, um, it would have to be a genocide conducted by both sides of the, both parties to the conflict. Um, 
that uh, <coughs> this is a question to Saru again on a similar uh, line. Um, I'm from Sri Lanka. I lived there for 25 years of my life. And um, LTT is no one except Tamils. Yeah, they're fighting for Tamils. Stick to the question, please. Yeah, yeah. they're fighting for Tamils. And they never targeted civilians. They never target even a single civilians. They, they never ever want to target Tamil civilians. And Sri Lankan government has been genociding Tamils since 1948, structurally, in a systematic way, politically, me. educationally. Please, please stick to the question. I'm, I'm sticking to the question. Short. I'm sticking to the question. It's about genocide. Yeah, please. Education-wise, you know about 1972 standardization brought into the action where the, the problem started. The arms struggle started, and um, all sort of murders, massacres, aerial bombardments, they're all there. So if you try to say that uh, LDT and uh, government of Sri Lanka equally killing Tamil people <laughs> is a, me, is a big a question. question. Sorry. Please. Yeah. So, so don't say that, please, because we know that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. Yeah. You got to answer, I'm answering my question. What is your question? My question is, what I'm saying is, 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 is what I'm saying is true, or is what you are saying is true? Is it equally government in Sri Lanka and LTT killing down people? Well, our report is based on facts and on testimonies by victims, Tamil victims who are fleeing the area, who talk about the LTT shelling. So it is not something which is a figment of Human Rights Watch's imagination, and it, no, it is no, it is a report which is based on. Um, actual independent information that has been provided by the few humanitarian agencies that exist there. So, you know, to say that uh, both sides are responsible, we don't know what's going on, we are reporting what has been told to us, you know, and uh, that these voices come out very strongly in the report. And they point out to an equal that both the Sri Lankan government and the LTT are equally to blame. So, you know, please read the report before you. Uh, Arjun, I think you had your opportunity. Please. Uh, Hi, uh, thanks. My name is BJ Jayanthan. I'm from the British Tamils Forum. Um, I'd, I'd be grateful if I could actually ask um, both the different questions for both uh, Francis Harrison and uh, Charles. Keep it short, please. I Don't will, make yes. Statements I will, yes. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you know about the, the, the uh, you know, thousands of people who are actually protesting out, outside the BBC, and it's it's so very important that BBC covers this, you know, very accurately. Um, you know, you, the, the BBC website uh, has a timeline. It's got the history of the conflict, and so it's it's, it's grossly inadequate. Um, it, it gives someone who who comes on and looks at the the, the conflict for who doesn't know anything about it uh, will see the Tamils as the aggressors. Someone who's come over recently to Sri Lanka. Um, question, please. And uh, yeah, so my question, I mean, based on the fact that obviously your your colleague um, George Alagaya, um, in in uh, colleagues from uh, from the BBC, wrote in his autobiography about what happened, why his why his parents. What is left. your question? Um, I'd, I'd like to build build up to it. Really, I mean, th I mean, I have oh to phrase yeah. it. Um, so we we only have a limited time. I understand. I understand. Uh, what's happened with with the, the the burning of the library? What happened to Tamils before the LTT came into into the thing? Is is genocide? Still so haven't got a question. Mike. Why doesn't the BBC accept that what's happening to the Tamils since independence is genocide, uh, structural genocide of the Tamils? And um, we know, I mean, same to uh, to to Charo from the HR, HRW. We have relatives in in the Vani. We we have we're Tamils. We have people there and. Um, uh, 100,000 people marched in London saying it was a genocide. Why don't you accept it? This is this is the, the view of the vast majority of the Tamils. Our MPs are being killed. Um, why doesn't uh, both the HRW and BBC accept that it's genocide of the Tamils in Sri Lanka? Thank you. I, I think one, one thing, you know, this is uh, the question, the, the discussion is not about genocide. So let's let's move on and you know, uh, I'll let my colleagues answer. Um, but just very quickly to, to drag back and answer your question. You know, I'm not the BBC, that's the problem. I'm not working for the BBC at the moment. He so also said he would like to watch. Yeah, I can yeah. answer. Um, no, I'm talking about Human Rights Watch because the question was posed to Human Rights Watch. 
and to the BBC. Well, essentially, uh, my point would be that popular perception does not make fact. So if 100,000 people believe that something is happening, it does not mean that it is actually happening. There are legal standards that have to be satisfied. There's a particular a quantum of evidence that needs to exist in order for, for a particular incident to be constituted a genocide. And in answer to your question, Arjuna, yes, you are absolutely right. No humanitarian agencies operate in the Vani, but there are humanitarian agencies right outside the Vani who have access to detention centers and to hospitals, and some UN humanitarian convoys have gone into the Vani. So our information is based on all these sources. Lord Henry well, uh, as France is not working for the BBC anymore, I think I, I'll have to answer it for the BBC uh, as a current member of staff. Um, I think, you know, uh, as Charu said, uh, popular perception or 100,000 or many thousands of people marching in and calling it a genocide does not actually make it genocide. There are certain standards, and, and we the, using words like even terrorists uh, genocide, the BBC is very careful about that. And uh, I think we had been reporting the conflict very fairly, very balancedly, a balanced way as much as we can. Uh, we have problems where we can't get people. We have to protect our uh, reporters in the region who, who are extremely vulnerable. But we, we still try, try and cover the story as much as we can. Uh, different people with different perception will have the, the person who is coming from a singular background will have other grievances about our coverage. So I, I understand where you're coming from and what your grievances are. Similarly, the other side have other problems as well. So hopefully, we will get it, we'll try and get it right. I mean, uh, maybe I could just make a suggestion that rather than discussing round and round and round this genocide issue, maybe we can talk about what can be done to ameliorate the situation at the moment. I think everybody agrees that there is a very serious humanitarian problem in the Vani. And rather than arguing the rights and wrongs of both sides, I mean, is there anything practical that anybody thinks can be done given the very entrenched positions of both sides? I mean, the LTT are talking about a ceasefire. For the government, that's almost a dirty word. Is there any way in which something can be done that's practical to help people? Lady at the back. Yeah, hi. Um, I actually, as to the human rights person, and also I want to answer your, your question that you just posed now. Um, to, the, to the information that you actually said before that people are actually saying that um, the LTT are using their, the civilians as human shields. How are you getting that information? If they're from detention camps, aren't they scared? Um, of actually, that they have kind of been forced to say that, yes. that the t LTT are shooting them. Because I actually have an auntie who is in Vani, and she phoned two days ago actually saying, because they get a one minute call saying they're too scared to come out because of Sri Lankan army. Now, I don't know how you get that information, uh, civilians coming and talking to you saying the LTT are shooting their own civilians. If you're getting information from, from detention camps, they're gonna be scared um, of saying the truth because the army is around him. Um, this information, sorry, can I answer your question? The information about the LTT has not come from the detention camps. You the said victims, that before, though. The victims you? of the LTT shelling or the shooting by the LTT are now in hospitals or are being taken care of in some way by s or, or have had some access to humanitarian agencies. But so don't, they have, don't they have the Sri Lankan force around the hospitals? You're absolutely right that people in detention camps are too scared to speak. and Just like the journalists are reporting the truth, the civilians are scared to tell the truth as well. Well, the truth lies somewhere in between. Not all the civilians are lying, not all the civilians are telling the truth. So even the civilians you talk about Sri Lankan army shelling perhaps are not telling the truth. The civilians who are talking about the LTT firing are perhaps not telling the whole truth. So it is very hard to gauge. You know, give in this situation, I'd like to move ahead, move this discussion ahead, and talk about what can be done. What because can be done is more international pressure needs to be put on and allow so journalists think, to uh, access know, the area. We, 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 we are going to a dialogue between you two. It's, it's not fair on other people. Um, and not only the civilians, the, uh, the humanitarian organization, the UN, ICRC, they had all, in their reports, they had said that there was some firing by the LTT towards the uh, fleeing 
civilians and they had been trying to stop. So not only civilians, there are other sources as well. Um, it, they could be right, they could be wrong, but uh, there are sources. Gentlemen. Uh, I'm a Muslim. I've lived in Sri Lanka for the last 66 years. I am here only yeah. for the only for three years. Having gone through, observed all the situations since 1956. Well, I lost my Tamil friends. I have lost Can you stick to the question, yeah. please. Please make it short. We and I know the time. I know the ousting of the Muslims and the killings of the Muslims. Well, that is genocide or not? Is a question. But still, I think. It's the fallout of the entire situation in Sri Lanka, where corrupt politics has got into the livelihood of the Have people. Have you got a question? Please. Yeah. What I want to know is, since all sides are the fault, what I can assume from what you all have said, what can the journalists internationally do to bring about peace and reconciliation in the country between all communities without any to bring a into the suffering. So I am working with Mr. Jaiwad and in that, with that objective. So I would like to know what the journalists could do in that regard. Well, you haven't answered any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a politician to give that answer. Um, what uh, needs to be done is we must uh, go out uh, where the the journalists who have managed to escape must remain in the media profession and not give in to pressure and seek um, other work. It's easily said than done when you have a family to bring up and you can't find work, you have to work in a supermarket or something. But uh, I'm the secretary of the Exile Journalist Network we, uh, which uh, the members of which are now nearly 200 uh, journalists from 40 countries. And we, I have seen very destitute journalists who doesn't have money for bus fare. And uh, so there used to be news editors, uh, head of media organizations, but in this country, it's a different ball game altogether. So what, uh, we should do, I mean, I'm talking about Sri Lanka. If I talk about Sri Lanka, most of the journalists who have come here, and there's just one journalist I know who's been asking me whether he could get some support. He hasn't got enough money. He didn't have to ask that. I felt so bad for him. And the same situation was for me when I came here. We were given vouchers to buy stuff. And I was so embarrassed to go to Sainsbury's and give that, and I used to give it to my niece and get my sister to give me the uh, money for the voucher. So the thing is, uh, uh, if you overcome all these problems, if you are patient and stick to media profession, then you can tell the world what has been going on back home. You have to stay, you have to be stay focused on your profession because journalists are, are the conduit to the civilians and the government. And uh, without journalists, I, I think uh, journalists are very important in Sri Lanka, especially given the kind of intimidation threats. We must not cow down to pressure from the government. I know it's easily said and done talking from here, but um, those who have come out have a responsibility towards the journalists who are out there. Okay, so, uh, gentlemen over there. Yeah, Re hello, Re what can be done? Uh, instead of listening to nonsense, like ch what ch ch Charu is just talking about, about, she just said the hospitals are as bad as, uh, a few minutes ago, as bad as the... Speak up, please, I can't. The hospitals are as bad as the camps. What can be done is to wash your ha blood off your hands and report. Journalism probably has some tradition. Look around us. People get in there and report. Do the journalistic job. Then you will save the Sinhalese and the Tamils 
This is serious problem in Sri Lanka. You have failed, and you have been only trying to pull out people you know, and out of your conscience trying to pull them out to Canada or someplace. It's, it's silly. Have you got a question? Uh, the question was, uh, what can be done? And uh, okay, I'll say, please wash your ha blood off your hands and report. And are you prepared to do it? I don't quite understand what you're trying to say. Gentlemen here. I'm Arasan from uh, British Association of Tamil School. I represent um, about 30 Tamil schools in uh, UK. Um, using the common sense, uh, when um, media and the journalism is under threat in any country, there is no basic democracy. The country is ruled by state terrorism. That's what the definition is. And, um, um, and Excuse today me, you, you have a question for yeah, us, the or you're trying to make speech? The question is, today, um, uh, in Vanni, uh, media and journalists are banned by the Sri Lankan government, whereas LTT is welcoming uh, the uh, media. So where is your idea come from? Uh, I'm um, asking the Saru. question here uh, to Saru, that um, apply com basic common sense where does your idea come from that uh, people are getting killed by, uh, whereas uh, LTT is uh, wholeheartedly welcoming the uh, media inside the zone? Uh, uh, or are you, um, f I mean, watching it from here, or um, on the other hand, how did you get this job as well? <laughs> uh, I think uh, you have answered the question before, um, so. I ask you um, a question uh, as a Norwegian journalist. Um, I mean, uh, would you? Uh, yeah, well, would you like to see um, the Norwegian negotiators back? Or I mean, uh, some somebody has to start. Uh, doing this. We didn't do it very well because uh, <laughs> you started fighting again, but um, still, uh, who can you uh, ask to do that kind of job? You, as a mediator, should yeah. maybe answer that. I think anybody would like somebody. It's Thank you. My answer will be, um, it shouldn't be a situation like uh, before, where Norwegians went as uh, facilitators. Uh, they should go with power. They should go as uh, mediators, and they must have uh, sanctioning powers, very clear um, uh, um, authority for them to continue with their process. Uh, within the five years they were involved, nothing was achieved because they were just mediators uh, between two boxes. They were trying to keep them apart, like you see. And also the situation has changed quite a bit now. Indian involvement is uh, considered very seriously. All the governments are directing uh, their influence through India. So India's consent is very important. And uh, India has to play a part. Uh, India has been sidelined all this while. You can see uh, the Indian interest in this matter. Uh, with, the with the elections that is coming up in India, um, things are going slow. Possibly after the election, you will see some big movement on the Indian front. Even Norwegian, you know, even the British, even the American, you and everyone is focusing on India, India to resolve this problem. Any other question? You wanted to ask a question? Uh, my name is Anna Horst, reporter. I also work for the BBC at the moment, and I was with Frances in Sri Lanka when she was there. Following on from the question about the peace mediators, I mean, I disagree. I think it did get quite far along the way with Ranul Vikramasinghe, and I think um, it was a terrible shame that it was curtailed. Do you think at the moment when the government of Sri Lanka is sensing military victory, whether or not you know, they're going to get to it, do you think there's any room for negotiation? And also, if there is, who would they negotiate with in the Tamil political leadership? <coughs> I think this is that you pinpointed the problem, that the government thinks they're very, very close to victory. They don't see anything in it for them. And I think when you look at it, it is a problem. They talk about eliminating the tigers. 
and they think they're very close to that. And if they were to stop now, the tigers would have another breath of fresh air, they'd be able to <coughs> recruit again, catch up, and so on. And even if you talked about a solution where you talked about safe passage for the leadership of the LTT, if they went abroad, they could start again, they could collect money, they could come back. There, it's very difficult to present to the government side a solution that isn't the one they're envisaging, which is total elimination of the LTT, unfortunately. And um, to go back to the Norwegian mediation, I think the problem is not the LTT side. They wouldn't have a problem with the Norwegians again. From what I understand, they're still in touch with them. <coughs> it's the government side that wouldn't want to see Norway involved again. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether the Norwegians would want to get involved considering the price they paid. I mean, their flag was burnt. They were denounced. They were called white tigers and all this sort of stuff. They weren't exactly thanked for the efforts they made, and they were considerable efforts. And to the gentleman, somebody who said, I think it was you, who said that the peace process didn't achieve anything and was sort of useless. I mean, clearly it didn't achieve peace, but I think it did, you know, it did make some strides. I mean, what I saw was from the LTT side, which had lived very isolated for a long, long time because of the embargo, because of the war, um, the LTT interacting with the diaspora, with expatriate Tamils who had a more Western perspective. They knew how the West worked. They brought in expertise, you know, building expertise, computer expertise, whatever. And I think that was extremely valuable for the LTT organization in Navani. There was always that tension. You didn't give your sons and daughters to fight. You just gave money. You went abroad. You lived comfortably. You know, who are you to tell us what to do? Um, but on the other hand, there was a learning process both ways. And I think that was quite useful for the LTT leadership. I'm, I'm asking all the members of the panel that uh, taking into consideration the present humanitarian crisis, in particular Human Rights Watch uh, report about Avania Hospital, and also we are hearing about the patient being transported to Tingamala Hospital, and they have been discharged with, uh, with other transport doctors, and they are sent to even pregnant mums have been sent to the camps with, uh, soon after the birth of the children. And in Tringamal Hospital also, there is a mom with both arms and legs amputated, and she had the twins, and she wanted to commit suicide because there's not, she's really in a real predicament. As a panel, what sort of practical advice you can give this audience who are interested in helping the uh, people? And also important, quarter million people, or it varies, so 200,000 or 250,000 people in the Vanni, where the LTT area, there are only three doctors, there were eight doctors, three doctors have left, uh, and there were three or four doctors. How the panel could advise us to do something practically and with the expertise and skill in this field? Thank you. I'm asking all the members to contribute. Uh, I don't know, as, as a journalist, that you know we can report what's happening and get the uh, attention of the world as much as we can. Um, in, in our profession, we don't get involved. Uh, we report. So, uh, so I think you know what we can do is to uh, bring attention of the world to the story and about the plight of the people. Anybody else? What I can say is, uh, first of all, uh, the diaspora Sri Lankan community has to come together, like-minded diaspora uh, Sri Lankan community. This is Tamils without uh, the forgetting the rivalries, at least come to basic understanding to uh, uh, work together. And also there are like-minded Sinhalese and also Muslims uh, uh, in, um, in large numbers here. And uh, we must come together and exert pressure as Sri Lankans. And uh, the problem that uh, we have at the moment is we are campaigning on the basis of certain groups. And we are not achieving that much because uh, you have been identified a particular group. You have uh, basically a mandate to carry on this work life. So we had to come together as Sri Lankans. And we had to exert pressure in a, in a sensible manner. in touch with a lot, lot of doctors in Colombo, one of the things they are saying is that even the, uh, the doctors are very polarized, especially the Tamil doctors were in Colombo feeling frightened to say either with us or against us. And Sri Lankan Medical Association, they have no ethical moral code. They have not come up and advocated or defended some of the government doctors working in the LTT control areas. So that's one of the predicament we have. And whether we are polarized here or not, back at home, that we are unable to do anything. 
in particular, Sri Lanka Medical Association has to unable to do anything for these doctors who are trapped and helping the people. And they are not raising a voice either, saying that it's a moral, ethical duty of care of looking after the <coughs> quarter million people. And in a particular time, there are a lot of war injuries. Thank you. Yeah, I think you know the doctors are in, in a specially difficult predicament, and there were singular doctors working in the East who recently got murdered as well. Uh, so it, it's it's like journalists, you know, they are in a very difficult situation. Just add to that. In fact, um, uh, the information I gathered from uh, uh, the cleared areas, the currently cleared areas. Uh, the doctors who had gone to uh, give medical assistance, uh, they are confirming, even the, uh, the Sri Lankan forces are stra suffering in the sense uh, uh, there is, the, there is, there is uh, the government is trying to, uh, basically those who have been killed, they have been dumped in the sea and they have been uh, thrown into the uh, um, jungles and they have been treated as uh, persons missing in action. So. There, are, there is element uh, of uh, worry on the Sinhalese side as well, not only Tamils, and of course they are combatants, end of the day, the army, and the government has to look after them. If you see the number of possibly when the, all these things uh, come to an end, uh, the people lost in, uh, the, in, the, in, the in the action will be a sizable number, and uh, where they have gone, uh, we don't know. These are directly confirmed by doctors who are serving in the cleared areas, and it's a very worrying factor as far as they are concerned. And also, if this is, if this is happening to the, um, um, the combatants, that is the army, what, is, what about the civilians uh, in that area? Can I take it? I'm just wondering, in response to your question, which is a very good one and very difficult to answer, whether there's anything you could do with medical associations abroad. I mean, certainly there's Tamil doctors who are in the Vani who send out very almost pathetic kind of emails and messages and Excel spreadsheets of how many people injured and what injuries and so on. I mean, their story is extraordinary, the things they're, they're coming out with. And even some of the government officials who work in the rebel areas who speak out and say what's happening against both sides sometimes, those people are, are pretty independent and, you, you, and quite brave to do that. Is there nothing you could do in terms of networking abroad if you think in Sri Lanka there isn't a, an, a kind of unity? Yeah, for example, I think. Thank you. Yeah, again, I mean, we, we in the BBC, you know, we have contact with some of the doctors who almost daily send us reports, pictures, uh, but they had been reprimanded for doing that. Is anyone here? I, I, I feel very disappointing in the sense that the polarization is, is very extreme here. And I, I, I'm asking a question whether you can do something through, I don't know how, through maybe forums or through uh, media forums, BBC forums and so on, to create a dialogue between the Sinhalese community and the Tamil community. That is not taking place at the moment. You could see the polarization here today. And that is one question. And the second question is, I felt up until 1964 period, the media freedom in Sri Lanka was so very, very en enviably good. Uh, I feel that it is to do with the type of government that was there, the constitution, and the not so concentration of power. Since the change of constitution in 77, I think that everything started going down the hill. Concentration we, we of we don't have much time. So, so maybe can you say whether that is true in terms of media fr freedom, whether there was a substantial change as a result of the constitution? Second one is mm -hmm. forums to create dialogues between the singular community and the. Well, you I just want to say one other thing. I like to defend the right of Charu to sit here and take part in the discussions without being intimidated. It is a very unfair thing. The 98, uh, sorry, the 78 Constitution, uh, which brought in the Prevention of Terrorism Act, also forbids, uh, has uh, imposed a lot of uh, laws on journalists. Journalists, uh, media is included. And um, 
Yes, you are right that uh, we held a greater degree of autonomy in reporting prior to that. But no amount of media laws are going to be effective if the, the so-called Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka does not act democratically. So the situation is not just the government, but um, the effects of government not recognizing Tamil rights has uh, spawned the LTTE and such groups, as well as JVP. Uh, so the, the, the current scenario is not, it has nothing to do with the change of constitution. It's to do with the successive governments which are not genuine in their attempts. These negotiations started with um, from uh, uh, Banda Chalvanayakam Pact and uh, 87, uh, 86, 86, sorry, 56, and subsequently uh, Timpu talks, uh, then four round of peace talks under Mrs. Kumaratunga in, from 94, and then again to the, there has been no genuine desire by the majority Singhala government to recognize the rights of Tamils, to recognize that they have been denied. Uh, I, I wanted to say something in response to the idea of single Tamil dialogue and so on. One of the things I noticed during the peace process with the opening of the A9 road was that uh, you know huge numbers of Sinhalese from the south <coughs> went up north, went through LTT areas, and went to Jaffna. And you know they really and people ordinary people interacted in a way that was quite unique. And people from Jaffna came to Colombo. Uh, what sticks in my mind was uh, Jaffna University students who came to Colombo for some program that was organised by an NGO. And these are young sort of very young boys, and they were saying to us, "This is the first time we've talked to Sinhalese people who are not peering down the barrel of a gun at us. In other words, not soldiers." And you know, it's quite a shock for us to see that we can interact with them and that they're human and we can have a discussion. There's a huge gulf, there's a huge gulf in experience, but to have that dialogue is incredibly valuable. And I think that is what, what started during the peace process and unfortunately didn't get very far. But I think the other aspect of it is it's quite easy to have a friendly discussion and then go back to your entrenched position, the position of your community and what you're used to. What the peace process, in my opinion, really failed with was there wasn't any kind of attempt at truth and reconciliation. When we were in Thailand during the peace talks and there was some discussion about whether this would be on the agenda, then we heard, no, it's not going to happen. Neither side wants to talk about the past. Both sides have things they don't want to discuss that they've done. And I think that was a, a real failing because if you don't go back and look at what caused this war, um, on what both sides have done that's wrong to each other, then you can't really ever move forward from that. So. For example, I did a documentary at one point on the 20th anniversary of the 83 riots. And I mean, the reaction I got from people in Colombo, even who was quite sympathetic from the government was, it wasn't even you did it wrong. It was like, how, why did you do this? You know, you shouldn't touch this subject, basically. You shouldn't go back and look at this thing. We're in the middle of a peace process. We want to move forward. Don't go backwards. So I think actually it's really important to go back and look at these issues and discuss them. And I think the idea of Tamil singular dialogue in the diaspora is also quite valuable. I mean, if it can't happen in Colombo, at least you guys can initiate it here. Yeah, I think Francis's idea of truth and reconciliation, and I think there are atrocities committed by both sides. Uh, rather than accusing at each other, if somebody go to record it, you know, we have to have uh, the historical record of what has happened. I think that is important. I think we only got time for one or two questions. Uh, did anyone know that? Hi there. Um, I represent a group called Tamil Students Against Genocide, and we're going to start a campaign um, about uh, an awareness week. And one of the main aims of the campaign will be question, please. So yeah, one of the main aims of the campaign will be to try and get Sri Lanka kicked out of the Commonwealth. And you were talking earlier about what the international community can do to help prevent this the atrocities that are being committed. And members of the Commonwealth have to abide by the Harare principles. They have to you know, abide by certain rules and regulations. Do you guys also believe that 
Sri Lanka should get kicked out of the Commonwealth or other sanctions or th they're part of the GSP plus program as well. Do you not believe that this should also occur, that they should be kicked out of the Commonwealth for their abuses that they've committed? I think, you know, uh, I don't have an opinion. BBC never have any opinion <laughs> on anything. <laughs> but, um, but it will be a good campaign to, uh, you know, uh, uh, good, story for you. Good, good story for me. Uh, and also uh, such campaigns like uh, uh, in uh, Pakistan, it worked. Uh, in Zimbabwe, it didn't work that much, probably. Pa in Pakistan, the kicking out Pakistan of the, out of the Commonwealth actually got the ball rolling against the uh, uh, president at the time. So good luck with your campaign. But uh, we don't have an opinion on that. Well, I would just point out that I think the two countries that have most influence over the Colombo government would be India and America. So, I mean, in terms of lobbying, maybe not Commonwealth. I mean, it, does it really help the situation immediately in the money? Maybe long term, it's part of a political propaganda campaign or political campaign that you have. But I think that the focus should be much more how you can help those quarter of a million people who have no medicine, who have no food, who are being shelled. And the Commonwealth is, you know, neither here nor there for them at the moment. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it or it isn't an argument, but, you know, what can you do immediately for those people uh, in terms of lobbying, in terms of pressure, in terms of international awareness? Jaru, you want to add? Yeah, just to say that, you know, um, well, basically, you know, lives are being lost in Sri Lanka as we speak. So f for us in Human Rights Watch and our partner organizations like Amnesty and other organizations who have continually reported on Sri Lanka, it's primary that some safe corridors are established to allow the civilians to leave, that the screening at the detention centers, there is international presence, so that given the climate of long, long large-scale disappearance in Sri Lanka, we do not hear of other such incidents happening, and also humanitarian access. So these are our primary demands. We continue to raise them with the UN, in Geneva, in New York, with concerned governments, including Japan, which is the largest bilateral donor to Sri Lanka. So in that sense, our concern is primarily for civ civilians in Sri Lanka, and we will do everything to get international attention on the subject. I think one last question. You, you have, uh, yeah. Okay, you, you, you're at the back. Uh, hi, my name is Sanji Sanjeevan. Um, Please keep it short, we okay. might get another question. Uh, my question to Charu, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, report mentioned about 2,000 people being killed. Can she um, give a quantity in terms of how many people were killed by Tamil Tigers and how many were killed by the Sri Lankan army? Uh, 100, 200, uh, 101? Uh, or uh, the question two is, um, uh, how many more people needs to be killed before it's called genocide? I think this genocide word is coming up and up <laughs> again. Uh, let's. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to get into the genocide debate because I think we've had enough discussion on that. But in answer to your question, these are reported <coughs> figures on casualties, the body counts. Now, corpses don't say who killed them unless there is a thorough investigation on you know, what weaponry they died of, who was using the weaponry, and given the long, sort of long-standing climate of impunity in Sri Lanka, we cannot expect such an investigation to happen on such large-scale civilians. Not all civilians, it must be added, have died because of rules of war violations. You know, so it is natural, and it, it does happen in any conflict situation that civilians do get killed. But the, the question is whether the civilians get killed because they've been purposefully targeted, whether they've been killed in safe areas, whether they've, they've, whether they've been targeted in areas which are demarcated as areas which should not be killed under international humanitarian, which not should be attacked under international humanitarian law, and whether the civilians have been killed while they were le trying to leave the areas. So it is very hard to establish who killed how many, but the fact is that 2,000 lives have lost and more will, will die if we don't act now. Uh, maybe one last question. Yeah, one, you, you're the last person, very last, I promise. So yes or no answer. Yeah. Do you think the Tamil Tigers will be extinguished within the next 24 months? Um, and second question, what, which is a not a yes or no answer, is what is the What's a, a good summary of the likely response from India, if you could dig deeper than the surface? I know there's an election coming up, but how would you view the Indian view, uh, attitude generally? 
Uh, I'll give you one, then, then I pass on. Uh, Tamil Tigers are finished or not, very difficult to say. Uh, yes or no, because you know, you know what happened in Iraq? The mission accomplished a long time ago. A lot of people died since. And India, I think uh, the, the main question for India at the moment is the Tamil Nadu. The, there is a lot of uh, nationalism, <coughs> sympathetic forces to the uh, Tamil community in Sri Lanka. It's developing into such a phenomena which the Indian government never expected it to be. So I think they're, they're going to seriously have to look into it. Now, Karunanidhi is getting very old. He might, he's the chief minister, he's like the, the main guy in, you know, politically. After him, what happens and the, the, that will come into uh, play, I think, the nationalism in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, that will be a main part of the Indian thinking. Yeah, yeah. You asked a direct question, let me uh, give a direct answer. Um, unless the root causes of the problems are solved, LTT is going to remain in some form or shape. Um, it is going to be there. They won't be able to have a territorial control, but they are going to engage in uh, guerrilla activities and all those things are going to happen. So the problem has to be solved politically, and uh, the government has to take serious steps in that direction. And I want to add uh, one more um, uh, point concerning Human Rights Watch. There was considerable criticism on, uh, from the audience about uh, some aspect of their work. Uh, Human Rights Watch is the only organization that has come out so forcefully so far on all aspects of the problems uh, uh, faced, by the, uh, face, faced in Sri Lanka, even in the diaspora. And these documents have to be considered in an objective manner. And what is happening is the emotions are let loose so, uh, in a frustrating way. And uh, it is causing all sorts of problems. And uh, the documents, if somebody sits down and analyze them and look at the difficulties they have in gathering those information, to provide, provide, provide us the basis uh, uh, to understand the things, uh, we can do quite a bit. You see, we had to think positively and uh, go, uh, go forward, I will say. OK, thank you very much for everyone. You know, it's been a very interesting evening. Um, so we have to finish because we are already all running. Uh, thank you.